copying um copying is you know in memory uh, i'm i'm uh, i mean the copy operation in memory when i mention copying in this context copying is transferring a block of memory from one place to another basically and it's a slow operation because a ram uh, memory is slower than CPU itself. Uh, actually, orders of magnitude slower than the CPU. And uh, because of that, we invented mechanisms that lets us to avoid the overhead of copying. And how, how we do that, basically, we are using, instead of copying every time a big data block from some place to another, we just use uh, references to them. And references or pointers uh, in uh, uh, archaic lingo <laughs> uh, are just small numbers that point to a certain location in memory that points to that structure uh, in the in the in the memory and uh, references are used as a managed version of pointers basically references are like tracked pointers the garbage collector can track references that's why we have two different terms pointers and references but both essentially mean that a number that just points at a location in memory why are we using them because first we don't want to have the overhead of copying and second we want to be able to use the same structure we changed and we want our changes to be visible in every place that references to the same location. That's that's uh, basically how it how it works. We still have some non-reference types like enums and structs. Uh, I'm not gonna go over enums. I I wanted to, but uh, I can give an example about structs and why they exist basically. Uh, so uh, struct is just like a class but it has value semantics instead of reference semantics. And value semantics mean that the structure by itself has a, as a whole gets copied when you pass it to a function, when you assign it to a variable. So let's say you have a 10 kilobytes of data structure. When you have that, when you pass it around, you, you are passing, if you are passing, passing it by value, you're passing it like a 10 kilobyte data packet everywhere. And that's slow. A reference on a 64-bit system, a reference is just eight bytes. So when you pass around uh, references, it's really fast. But when you copy 10 kilobytes of data everywhere, it, it gets slower and it accumulates. So that's why references are usually preferable. But that's not always the case. So I'd like to show you the layout of the class versus struct. Um, uh, here and uh, as you can see we have stack that we use a, as a memory temporary memory for current function executing and normally all your local variables are allocated on the stack when we allocate a class we allocate two different memories. We allocate its reference on the stack, but actual data is allocated in the heap memory, which is a larger memory tracked by garbage collector. And uh, as I said, I, I explained this in detail in the book as well, but here I'll just, you know, give you the uh, accelerated course <laughs> on this. So uh, when you class with a single 32-bit integer, like let's say ID class. Let's say we have a customer ID class. We also have extra data for that class so it can be tracked and it can be used in object-oriented programming scenarios like inheritance and stuff. Uh, so we have extra data along with it. So if, in order to allocate just four bytes, you actually allocate eight bytes here, 16 bytes here, 24, 28 bytes in total right? But when you have a struct with just an integer in it, it just gets uh, four bytes on the stack. It doesn't have heap allocation or anything. And why would I have a small class or small struct like uh, customers, customer ID, right? Uh, the, the good thing about this is, you know, um, 
let me show an example again. Um, let me create a class here just for the sake of example. Um, let me see. Yeah. Let's create an example called customer ID here. So why would I have a class just for an ID? Something like this. Let's call this private set right now. Or just let it can say. So uh, why would I have a something like this? Uh, customer ID, um, your business might require your customer IDs to be in a custom range. There could be invalid identifiers. For example, a valid identifier could be between 1 million and 10 million, something like this. And uh, if you use an int integer instead of customer ID, then um, you, you can basically get invalid value. And you have to validate that everywhere. And as I mentioned in the book, you can use this uh, approach to actually avoid any invalid data throughout your program by using a custom class. And how, how can we make sure that it's a valid class? So basically you first disallow it, uh, uh, it from being modified and just add a constructor. That's how I do it. So how I add a constructor, I just type CTOR and click tab twice. I'm doing it slow so uh, you, you can see it. And it receives an ID. And I just initialize the property with it. And I can add any validation logic here, right? So if ID is less than 1 million or ID is greater than da da da, da then I can just throw an exception out of range exception like this. This is the right way of doing it. And um, so the good thing about this is let's have another class. is that you can actually have uh, a function here that receives a customer, do something with the customer, right? Customer ID, ID. What this ensures is first, this function only gets valid customer IDs, right? The second one is, it also ensures that it only gets customer IDs. Let's say you have, you also have user ID. And, uh, and it has the same semantics basically, but it, it's, it's also between one and 10 million. Let's assume that. And now this kind of type distinction lets you to write correct code. If you try to call this, let's let's call it from another function. Do something else, right? And let's create a user ID here. Oh, not, this is not the right format. Let's make it 10 million one. Yes, you can write numbers like this, so you can see number of zeros clearly. Uh, so, and let's try to call do something with the customer. So it's basically not possible. And that saves you from validation, basically. You don't have to validate your code each and everywhere. And th the problem with this though, we are creating a lot of overhead just to, you know, encapsulate a simple integer. And what we can do is just you, we can just uh, convert this convert this into a struct and lose the overhead. Now they are just they occupy the same space as an integer. Now if I create a new user ID here, it occupies only four bytes because it's an integer. Not it doesn't have all these over, overhead with garbage collector heaps blah blah. So it's way better this way. So this is the benefit you can get uh, by copying the data because the copy semantics of structs actually help you get better performance in these cases. Not every case though, let me show you. If you have a large struct, 
then that gets copied every time. So it becomes inefficient. You have to use your understanding of this mechanic in order to make conscious decisions about this. In this case, it's preferable. And structs have disadvantages too. Uh, it has like, you cannot use inheritance or other object oriented features with it. But the thing is, if you don't need that, you can definitely in this case, in a case where the storage is smaller than what a class would cause by with the extra overhead, basically. So, okay, let me see for copying. Uh, he, here's a question for copying. I saw a DOF device example before, which is one of the first examples of array unlooping. I think today compilers take care of that, but it was a light bulbing moment. Um, yes, DOF's device, I think uh, it's the, f it, it may not be the first loop unrolling example, but uh, it's genius in the sense that it used uh, switch case statements in C. It actually abused them. Uh, they uh, Duff, uh, I think his name was Tim Duff or Tom Duff. Uh, so he used it in a way that nobody would uh, expect it to, to be used. So, uh, but I, I'm not sure if it's the first instance of unlooping because the benefits of unlooping are clear. Like you can just uh, you reduce the overhead of the loop instructions themselves by just adding more instructions in between. Yeah, uh, unlooping is one of the ways that you can add to the performance of your code.